Okay. Let's hope it's up and running. If you're still there and you're still in chat, please say something so I have an idea if that's the case. Okay, we want to open that. We want to open... No, not that. That. Open. Okay. Um, okay. Do I have this for working now? Now, that's on the correct setting. That's on the correct setting. You're here. I'm working. Hello, 8-Bit Portal. How you doing? This is my Ashwadi. Man, that has me all freaked out that, that all these things went wrong all at once. This is my Ashwadi writing system. As you can see, it is really big. Really big. That's because I kind of cheated and... Um, generated one glyph for every vowel plus consonant or consonant plus vowel combination because that let me adjust the spacing very easily. And then I went in and, and set stuff up to make it all work right. So if we look at uh, preview right now, um, I'll get rid of that text just a sec. I can type in a um, I'm going to write Ashwadi, uh, A-S-H-U-A-D-I. So it's sort of featural. Um, it puts the dot below an S to mark uh, the fact that it's aspirated and it's an S-H. Uh, it puts the little hook above a T to mark that it's a D and is voiced. And um, it it's gone through like countless iterations to get to this point. I think 115 versions. Um, and each of those versions might have had five or six saves. Uh I started off imitating Kufic Arabic, which I don't read, don't speak, but love the look of, and built a writing system on the shapes from Kufic Arabic. And I liked it, but it looked a little too much like Arabic. And a few people that uh, could read Arabic looked at it and said, I'm all screwed up now because that looks like it should say something and it doesn't. Also, it's written left to right, not right to left. So at some point in there, I decided to start making it look less like uh, Kufic Arabic and changed a lot of things. I used to have a lot of uh, ascenders that went way up like uh, Kufic does. Uh, I got rid of those. I had one revision that was simply entitled Add More Pointy Bits, which I did. And it's evolved away from that. So it's it's similar to some degree, but uh, it's changed quite a bit in the meantime. It is fairly complex. It does have those featural elements, which I put in basically to make it easier for me to learn how to read it, uh, I will admit. But uh, also to reduce the number of glyphs I had, simplify the process of making it and doing things like that. I had a sudden realization the other day that I did it wrong. That I, I have a rationalization for this in my whole world building scheme. So I, I, I'm fine. I didn't waste any time or effort. I built something that I really like. But with the way the phonology works for the Ashwadi Conlang, which I'm still in the process of, well, actually working my third, third or fourth time through, um, I have this phonology in my head. And with the way it works, marking voiced and marking affricates actually isn't necessary. 
And I think the mistake that I made was I created a writing system that reflected the phonology instead of creating a writing system that reflected the romanization. And I think that's really quite important. And I'll show you why. Um, I don't have buttons made up for this, so I'll have to do it manually. This is uh, the, the phonetic inventory for Ashwadi. Um, it tends towards uh, reflex consonants, and it has a lot of allophones. So, uh, oh, I don't have a cursor showing there, do I? No. Um, the uh, the top row, the nasals, that's fine. They're they're um, they are as they are. The second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth rows, which have characters to the right. Those characters to the right are all allophones. Ashwadi does not distinguish for voice, and it does have uh, Africatized sounds, but it's entirely part of the phonotactics. Is that the word I'm looking for? It's, it, it's internal. They're allophones. So I decided I would try creating old Ashwadi that had none of those things because if somebody was speaking, um, they'll naturally shift between the allophones as they're speaking, and that would probably vary from dialect to dialect and stuff like that if I ever get that far. But when it came to writing them, they wouldn't write them. You wouldn't need to. If a, a T becomes a TH, t, t, th, in the course of speech, well, the speaker knows that. That's going to be a, a background assumption. It, the, the, we do that all the time with English. There's all sorts of circumstances where a particular sound is different in another circumstance, and it's just a reflection of the phonology. Uh, so this is the romanization for that. And why that matters is uh, the, the sounds that are part of the... the phonology may shift, the full version of Ashwadi allows you to type in these combinations, actually a little bit more than that, but I left it simple here, um, to get the results that you want in the script. But I don't actually need anything other than the first column. Now, uh, there's also vowels. Um, these are viewed as uh, short vowels on the top row and long vowels on the bottom, even though they shift a bit. Uh, the romanization is simply to uh, double them when entering them. So if I go to here again and type in T, and I want to have a long A, it extends it. Um, P and a long I, it will extend it. Uh, so I produced, mostly by deleting, old Ashwadi. Um, ignore the, the fact that some of them are highlighted in red. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And it has much less in the way of glyphs, uh, 435 of them, whereas uh, regular Ashwadi has 784. So in this version, I'll need to compile it. Um, there it is. When you go to uh, look at these, it's the same. But you will never have any of the diacritics that march, uh, mark Africa Africatization or uh, or fricatization or whatever the term is, or voicing. Because to a speaker of the language, a consonant, back to the phonology, a consonant um, of uh, M, P, T, K, S, or S, S, um, is voiced when it's near a front vowel, 
and uh, is fricatized uh, when it appears before another consonant in the cluster. Um, so, A, S, A. No problem. Asa. But if it was A, S, K, A, it would in the original version, it would be written A S H K A. So the S before a K would switch. So um, in the old version, it's just written as an S. The diacritics aren't necessary. Now I got to catch up with chat here. Um, this Ashwadi at only language family. Um, I have four languages at least that I want to design. I have bogged bogged down completely on designing the first of them. Um, I originally started to build a trade language for the world that I have in my head, uh, called Tajiradi. And then realized if I'm going to build uh, like a Creole or something like that, a simplified version of a language based on other languages in the area, I need to start building the root languages. And then I went to build Ashwadi. Uh, then there would be Ashwadi, there would be Tajaradi, which is a trade language. Uh, there would be a language I haven't even thought about that would come from the far south. And there would be uh, a, a completely separate language uh, on the other side of the area of the world that I'm building. And I haven't thought about that one yet either. And then there would be another language which was ancient and abandoned. And uh, I want to build all of those to some degree. I want to build more of Ashwadi than anything else. And Tajiradi as a trade language would probably only have a couple of hundred words. Um, so that's the plan. Now, all of this started off when I started building a world for role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games, and then had the terrible, terrible idea that, you know, creating a role-playing game can't be that hard, right? It is. It's very hard. I have about 120 pages of a rule system, which I've rewritten over the course of time and never finished. And I'm probably going to tackle that again at some point. But at some point in there, I thought, no, I got to build the world first. And then I'll have a thing to base it off of. And I started building the world. And then I thought, no, I need a writing system. And I need a conlang because I want to name everything appropriately. And it's just descended from there. And it's now just become a, a hobby of, of I'm going to build conlangs. And more specifically, I build writing systems more than I build conlangs. Um, I have built completed conlangs, well, more or less completed. I don't know if they're ever done. Um, professionally, I, I built one for a BBC Kids show that's never seen the light of day, at least not so far. I built one uh, called Marathi for a pen and paper role-playing game called the Nuwadden Chronicles, which uh, had a successful Kickstarter and I think is doing its second expansion now. Um, so that was fun. That was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I sat down and figured I have to I have to get this language going. And it's been extremely problematic and complex, uh, mostly because I got to bend my brain around it. I want to try making a uh, uh, three consonant cluster uh, Semitic style language like Arabic and Hebrew. And, and uh, uh, well, more recently, I learned uh Berber is, it falls in the same family. There's others in the Afro-Asiatic family. That is very hard to bend your brain around uh, how the structure works when everything is basically a verb or derived from a verb. So I've had some false starts on that. And then I had a computer crash and lost everything and started again. And now I'm probably going to start it again. And I might even change the way things work. But um, the idea remains that I want to come up with this writing system to work the way I want. Now, next thing. Uh, after seeing your 
Can I ask if you steer away from any similarities to Latin script, or do you not let that affect your design and just let it roll with what looks good? Um, designing a writing system that doesn't look like something else is pretty hard. Uh, not only because we have so many writing systems that humans have produced that we've probably exhausted a lot of the um, the effective looks, but also just because you get shaped by things you've seen. Like like I said, this one started off, I mean, I'm being entirely uh, um, stereotypical here. My world in that area is a desert world. I started thinking Arabic and, and Semitic and, and everything else like that. And that's what I decided the writing system should look like. And then I looked at Kufic Arabic and I love the way it looks. And Syriac, uh, I love the Syriac writing system as well. Uh, I don't want to make a right-to-left writing system because it's just very problematic in font software, and I read left-to-right, so uh, I built a left-to-right system. But um, it, it started off in that manner. So the initial design being based on Kufic Arabic looked too much like Kufic Arabic. So I moved away from it, and I've come up with stuff that is based off some of those shapes, but then been altered, hopefully, to not look like it. Um, if anybody out there reads Arabic, tell me if this looks very much like Arabic to you. It, it probably still does, to some degree. Uh, but I think it's got its own style now, and that's what the 115 revisions or so that I've done uh, have, have, have let me do, is, is change the way it looks to move away from that to some degree. So. What I've done here is take out every instance where a diacritic was there and then adjusted the the um, ligature features to let me continue to use it the way I want, but it's it's now it's now how it would probably actually have been used. doesn't have it, it it's an alphabet. it doesn't look like it, but it's an alphabet. It's an alphabet where uh, where it preserves the syllable structure. Um, do I have a page for that? Just a sec. Let me start something up here. Uh, where is it? There. Okay, we'll just put that in the background for now. No, we won't. We'll go over here and go to there, and there's notepad. Um, should be notepad. Yes. Okay, so the syllable structure for Ashwadi is basically consonant, vowel, consonant, like that. So a syllable consists of at least a vowel. It may have a consonant uh, in the, what's the correct term, onset, and it may have a uh, consonant at the end. But that's where all the allophones come in. So in a lot of cases, uh, the consonant at the end of a syllable is going to become Africanized or voiced or both. Uh, I hope that makes sense. So what the old Ashwadi version is going to do is not include any of those changes because a speaker is not going to need to know them. Um, if I'm writing ashka, I'm going to write aska, A-S-K-A, and the speaker is going to know that an S before a K becomes an S-H. So that's probably a more realistic version. It's not going to have all the little dicritics that look like they're they actually probably look to most people um, like they're going to be vowels or something like that, but there's only two of them. And they aren't vowels. They're they're uh, markers for fricatization, affricates, or voiced. Um, so my phonemic inventory is a lot smaller than it might appear to be, and that's going to be reflected here. So if I go back to font um, and close Notepad, uh, 
this is the reduced version of all the possible glyphs. And when we go to preview, if you type in a word, I'm just going to make stuff up. Actually, I'll use something out of the real world. Say uh, the city of Tashkent. If you type in T, it draws a T. If you type in A, it adds the A to it. If you type in S, you get T-A-S joined together. If I was to type in uh, H on old Ashwadi, it would put a dot in there, but on the, on this version, it doesn't. It's the same. Uh, K, E, N, T is a special N, T symbol. So Tashkent would be two syllable, Tash and Kent. And the writing system is designed to build up uh, words the way they're spelled according to uh, the syllables. So that's all made possible by features. Um, I use, I abuse uh, the uh, ligature function in uh, fonts that way. And I'll roll through it quickly. Um, that's what all this code here is doing, is it's saying um, when you type a key, this gets scanned, and it decides if it needs to take any action to change which glyph is shown. So the first little bit right here, that just says we don't need any uppercase characters. So the uppercase characters in the font are there, but they're all zero space, and there's no glyph there. If you type any capital letter from A to Z, it will replace it with the lowercase letter A to Z. That's what this first rule up here does. Then down here, we have lookups for uh, consonant combinations and what they should be replaced by. This is very simplified here because this is the uh, the old version and there's less combination. Then we have lookups for vowels, um, long vowels, then all the combinations. Uh, this one up here is just uh, digraphs, basically. Then you have all the combinations of a consonant plus a vowel or long vowel, and that's all these here. Then you have all the combinations of a vowel plus a consonant, which is here. And then this bottom whole section here is uh, determining whether or not a, a consonant or vowel is at the start of a word, in the middle of a word, or the end of a word, and switching the syllables around, uh, switching the glyphs around to reflect the, the syllable structure that way. Took a while to work all that out, and it doesn't work perfectly. There's a couple of fixes in there for odd things that can happen. Um, it's supposed to be the code that works, but uh, it doesn't quite work. So I've got all that working, and it, it, it does its thing. Um, it does mean, by the way, if you go to use this font, you have to have ligatures enabled in your software. But you can do incredible things with ligatures and classes combined. And that's how I can go here and have just the basic letters that are here. But if you type in a combination like ANG, well, if I can manage to get my mouse cursor to work, it will type in the A. And then NG, which is this slanted hooked shape there. Because what happens is when I type in the A, it goes through the font and says, oh, well, display an A. No problem. When I type in N, 
it displays the N. Uh, actually, it displays the AN glyph, one of all those glyphs at the bottom there. And when I type in a G, it goes through and says, oh, oh, no, that's not correct. It should be the ANG glyph and displays that instead. And it's taken a while to get there, but... Oh, more stuff. How did you learn all you know about language, specifically creating conlangs? Did you learn what you know online, or did you have formal teaching, or something else? Ah, good question. I uh, originally went to university. I was going to be a history major many, many years ago, and discovered that, oh my God, you can major in linguistics. So I took linguistics courses. And I dropped history as a, a major and, and became interested in linguistics. And I, I never got my degree. Um, I did about three years and I burnt out the end of third year. And I thought, no, I'm going to go away, make money, come back, and then I'll finish my degree. And I went away and I made money and I never went back and finished my degree. Um, however, I have been playing with Conlang's uh, starting when I was in high school. Uh, that would have been like 70, 1975, maybe. A friend of mine and I uh, came across a real-world slang that was almost a language called Sheltatari, which was spoken by uh, tinkers and gypsies in Ireland. And it's based on um, the Romani language mixed with uh, Irish and English. And we thought the English looked really glaring, and we thought that it was really neat to have this sort of secret language. Uh, there's a great book on it called Secret Languages of Ireland. Um, I've got a copy somewhere on my bookshelf. Uh, I think Professor R.A. Stewart wrote it. Anyway, uh, we decided that we would like to take Sheltatari and pull out all the English language elements, put in Irish. Uh, Gaelic grammar and derive source words from Irish for the English vocabulary that was in there and produce a sort of pure version of Sheltatari, um, which we did. Uh, it was like a 38 page document that detailed all the grammar and, and uh, our, our vocabulary and stuff like that. It had a couple hundred words. It was very cool. And I did that and uh, with my friend Arno, and, and we had produced this thing, and nothing ever came of it. We never published it or anything like that. There was no reason to and no internet to do it on. And uh, then years later, I end up taking linguistics, and I sort of played with stuff then because I was busy studying linguistics. And then I kind of dropped all that um when i got out of university and went off i i ended up joining the canadian army and i was in the canadian army for almost 10 years and then i got out of that uh honorably discharged and all and somewhere in there started playing i i mean i'd been playing dungeons and dragons and games like that since university days uh but i started playing with the idea of building a world for uh for a D&D campaign, and then I decided that I would try writing my own RPG, like I said. Uh, and then it, it devolved, like I said before. I, I decided to build the map, and I needed a mapping. Uh, I needed a, a language for the map, and uh, then I needed the conlang, and then I needed the writing system, and then I learned how to make fonts. And it sort of all cascaded uh, down the rabbit hole there. So it's it's a mixture of uh, doing the thing, some formal education, uh, lots of stuff picked up online. Um, if you haven't read it, I, I highly recommend that you get a book called uh, The Art of Language Creation by David Peterson, the guy who created the languages for Game of Thrones, The 100, and everything else on TV practically. Um, with the exception of the slang for the Expanse and uh, older stuff like uh, Klingon was created by Mark Ockrand. Oh yeah, I tried to learn Klingon at one point too. I've still got a couple of books on that. 
and Esperanto. Never got very far with that either. Um, but a lot of it's self-taught. Uh, all of this font stuff is self-taught. I started off with a very simple font program, learning how to make fonts. Then I uh, learned about features, and that font software wouldn't let me do features because it was free. So I shelled out, I think, 40 bucks for the upgraded version of it that did let you do features. And then, uh, well, various things happened, and I ended up spending money a couple of times, and I got to uh, this software here, which is FontLab Studio 7, which is probably the most evolved uh, font software out there. It's I'm I'm still learning things about this thing every day. It's just so deep. But to learn to use it's not that bad. Um you only have to know the basics and uh y you can get away with it. Um if you are interested in the free software which will not let you do features, so you can make an alphabet with it, but that's it. Um take a look for type light. I think it's at version 3.2. It's from a company called Create with an 8 in it. Uh, Create Software. And the same company has uh, a program called Type, which is 40 bucks, I think. And it will let you do features. It isn't as evolved as... Uh, FontLab Studio is, but it's it's still fully capable. Um, so, as for how all this stuff works, it is, uh, you said, so excited to learn to create these features, almost time to get started with this stuff for my script. Yes, well, here, um, let me bring up the features page. And I'll see if I can. That's probably kind of hard to read. I hope you're not on mobile. Uh, let me find my. I'm going to have to minimize this for a sec. That's going to take that away. Just a sec. And bring up that. And we'll bring the font software back there. Now, um, you, I have a cursor highlighter there, so you can at least see what I'm talking about. Let's see if the Zoom thing works. No, why not? Because it's probably conflicting with my font size. Okay, you can see all these sub-statements here. Um, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to Notepad. I can type there. Oh, I have another... Uh, too many things. Just a sec. I have another option, too. Uh, let's go to... here no nope something's failed me here and something's disappeared okay we'll use notepad uh notepad so when it comes time to create features on a font you need a liga statement that looks like that and ends with curly bracket liga semicolon. And everything inside there is going to be executed every time somebody clicks on a glyph or a key. So what you can do is, uh, the, the main thing I do is substatements. So if I have created a glyph for uh, NT, like I did there, I have a special glyph for that. Then I can go in and put in a sub statement that says sub N T by NT semicolon. And what that will do is when somebody hits an N, it won't do anything. When they hit a T immediately after it, then it'll scan through for the T and say, oh, there's a T after an N. I'm supposed to substitute those two glyphs for N and T with the new NT one that they've created. So uh, to actually mark this correctly, 
than tactically, you should put in a tick. Um, single quote. I've lost my cursor. There. It should actually be sub N tick, T tick, with a space between them, by NT. And NT would be a glyph that I have created. So if I go back to font and move that and scroll down here, uh, somewhere in here, this is the other thing is finding all of these things is a pain in the butt. Nope, I don't know where it is in here. Um, there is a search feature. Doesn't work worth a damn. Oh, no. There is UNT there. Uh, probably higher up. There. This is NT. Um, it's more complex than that. This is a form of the NT glyph. Uh, this is actually the one that would appear after a vowel. So if I go to preview and I type in, you want preview? A N T. That's the point where when I hit the T, it scanned through and said, oh, there's a T after an N, replace it. And it put this symbol in here. Now, it's more complex than that because there's also code to determine if it's at the start of a, a syllable or in uh, the end of a syllable and, and things like that. And there's some code in there that would sometimes produce different versions of it. Actually, I don't even know what it produces when it, if you can do it at the start, just a sec. Yes, you can. There's nta, N-T-A. So, oh, uh, FontForge does features for free. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, the uh, FontForge is another program that is available for Mac, for PC, and for Linux. It is entirely free. It is fully capable. It will do absolutely everything I'm talking about here, and you can use that. It is not that well documented, so uh, despite having lots of documentation, um, so you might have to struggle with it. But it will do all the stuff. I shouldn't. I shouldn't negate FontForge. I did try FontForge too, and I got frustrated with uh, trying to figure out how things worked and trying to figure out the interface for it because the guy who wrote FontForge did not like the way anybody else's operating systems worked. So. It's completely different. It doesn't obey the Windows standard formatting, and it doesn't obey the Mac one, at least the last version I tried. Um, it, it had its own unique thing going, which is fine and dandy. It's great, and it's open source software, and uh, I approve of open source software, but it was frustrating. And I gave up on using that and went to using uh, Type 3.0, and then from there, went to uh, uh, Font Lab Studio 5.1 and then eventually 7. But yes, you are correct. It does do all that stuff. So back to the substatement thing here. Um, that's a, a simple sub. Uh, where is my software? There it is. That's a... Oh, <laughs> Oh, weird. It's not showing the cursor on that. You can do other things. Like I said, the uh, substitution to get rid of capital letters um, by making them all lowercase. You can do, if I can type, sub brackets A to Z, or Z if you're up here in Canada, in brackets, tick by bracket, square bracket, A to Z, close bracket, semicolon. And that will take everything that is typed with the shift key enabled and
and make it lowercase. So you can do stuff like that. Um, you can in not in type. I'm not sure about Font Forge. Probably yes in Font Forge, but I never tried this. But finally, in version uh, seven of Font Lab Studio, you can do multi subs where you can have sub M by MN. Sorry, MN, like that. And it will, t when you hit an M, it'll automatically instead put in two glyphs. That's, that's new. It wouldn't do that in 5.1. You can also, let me switch again here to classes. Where is class? Classes. There are things called classes. And what classes are is ways to group your glyphs. So this class here, you, you can't see all of it, but uh, is all of the instances of a consonant plus a vowel in my glyph collection. And there are 108 of them. This is the same collection of glyphs, but with a different expansion, uh, extension, dot M-E-D-I, uh, because they're medial. So the first set is what gets displayed if it's just a consonant plus a vowel. If it's a consonant plus a vowel and then uh, there's something after it, another consonant or another syllable like this for some reason, then uh, this is the version it gets displayed. That's probably clear as mud, but um, if we go back here, if I go here and type in M I, that is M I on its own in the first CV syllables version. If I type in uh, S, then the first version, uh, the M I, this combination here has switched so that the I will connect to the S, and that is the, the mi.medi version of it, and there's code in the features to, to determine that. Then we've got a space, and we've got the mi character that is not, uh, uh, not changed. If I type in misa, it will switch because remember, we're preserving class, uh, constant tongue-tied. Uh, we're preserving syllables here. It will then type in MI and SA using the first class, the CV syllables version, and not the MEDI version, because it's not connected to a following consonant, for what that's worth. Then we have uh, all, of, all of VC. So verb followed by consonant possibilities here. We have all the consonants here and all the medi consonants here. And strangely enough, in this one, I don't have a vowels. Um, I don't have a vowels uh, class. Now, why does that matter? If we go, no, not preview, uh, features. If we go to features, and scroll down to the bottom here, way, way down, you will see that I am doing uh, checks where this, this line here says sub all CV syllables, and in brackets here we have W fina or Y fina, there are final versions of some of these as well, by MIDI syllables. And what that particular rule does is say, if you have a consonant with a vowel and either a W or a Y after it, use a different version of it. Maybe not a clear example either. Uh, and then there's some fixes in there. And this one down here is reversing some of that sometimes. And it takes a while to work all these things out. Oh, another thing. 
Um, oh man, I need to adjust things again. So we're on this here, which means I need it up here. Um, if you put a bunch of substatements in your Liga statement and compile it, when the font is checking things, it will check the Liga statements until it finds a match, and then it will stop. So in my features, I have a lot of lookups there. The syntax is lookup, name, whatever you want to name it. Don't hit the caps lock key halfway through. Curly brackets. Closing curly brackets. Name and semicolon. Same as it was with the Liga statement. When I have a substatement inside of a lookup like this, when the font checks the ligatures, it will always check every lookup. So you want to break all your stuff down into lookups if you can, and uh, include them that way inside of the ligature statement. Now it gets more complex than that because liga is not the only thing you can have. You can have contextual substitutions, uh, which I think are called C liga. Uh, you can have R liga, which is required ligatures, and and other things like that. I just use liga statements because the uh, writing software seems to support it best. I've tried doing it with R ligas and C ligas, and uh, say Word will support it, but Open Office won't, or something like that. Whereas the liga statements, if you say in your software use ligature statements, it will do it. Strangely enough, in Microsoft Word, I believe you have to specify that every time you're using, creating a document, a new document, you can't just turn that on and it's on forever. It has to be turned on every document. Open Office or LibreOffice, you just tell it to use ligatures and it'll do it. And some other software will just do it, period. Um, pretty much any Adobe product should uh, natively support ligatures no matter what. Um, I don't have Photoshop. So I can't test it in Photoshop, but I I believe I did test it at one point there and it worked without any problem. Uh, it'll even work with online graphics editors like Photopea. Um, you can upload a font you've created to Photopea and create artwork online that way. And, you know, then save it locally again. Um, so I'm, I'm heading off in three directions. I'm getting kind of confused with what I'm talking about. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's a technical thing that you really got to practice to get it working right and figure out what's going wrong, but it's, it's pretty good. And um, when you go to use your font, um, wrong screen, there's a little button up here that compiles. Okay, so if I make changes in here, I save the font and I hit that button there and it scans the whole thing and makes sure there's no errors. And if there is an error, it'll pop up an output window and say, hang on, couldn't do it. You've got this problem here on this line and you can go and fix it. But the syntax isn't all that complex here. I'm still finding out things about it, but it's, it's not that complex. Now, I was originally talking about classes and the one thing that I wanted to point out because it occurred to me a little while ago is, um, the glyphs that you include in a class, let's see if we got a small one here. No, even that one doesn't help you any. Um, the glyphs that you include in a class can be in more than one class. So you can have group a class A and class B and compare A to B and everything could be the same on all of those glyphs and nothing will happen except one glyph, which is different. And that allows you a little bit of control that way. You can have, as far as I know, any number of classes. So you can divide your font up any way you want. Uh, I have those ones there because those are the ones that I'm using to determine how stuff should swap. If, if this was Arabic, then there would be a, an isolated class and isolated versions of each glyph, uh, 
an initial, medial, and final version. And I started off building that with Ashwadi, and then I descended to basically having a start and an end for each glyph with a medial version in between, and that's it. So the consonants are in start form to begin with. The vowels uh, are as if they were final to begin with. And then I have uh, each of the syllables defined, and those are in regular and in uh, medial form where there's going to be something attached at the end. It, it it evolved that way. But that that is what I was trying to do here, and that is what I am working on here with, believe it or not, the simplified version of this font. Um, it's still a lot of glyphs. I didn't have to do it this way. I could have avoided that. I could have probably built it uh, in a different manner. And you could actually do something like this, even with the basic free software. Um, it wouldn't use features to join stuff together. But if you had your consonants be the, the, the start of a syllable and you wanted to attach vowels to them, you could do that by drawing the vowels so that they overlap with the previous glyph. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Here, I will bring up a glyph. Oh, I said at the start, uh, ignore these red ones here. That's These are glyphs that I did not delete because you still need to be able to hit the key, but you're never going to see them. And what I should actually do is delete the glyph itself and set the spacing to zero, like I've done uh, with all the uppercase characters here. If you actually don't, if I actually just deleted these glyphs and when I went to compile, uh, I would get an error message saying, I'm missing B, D, F, G, J, V, and Z. Do you want to create them or ignore the error? And I figure having an error like that is just going to cause problems. So I don't do that. So I could make these as blanks. And that's eventually what I should do is just go in here, uh, get rid of the content and move this. Oh, you're not seeing it there. Hang on. Move this line over here, which is the the right side bearing of the glyph, and just move it to the zero line, which is the line over here. Um, if you don't know, a glyph, any character uh, in a font, is uh, has a left side bearing and a right side bearing. The left side bearing, anything to the left of the left side bearing will actually be drawn in the space for the previous character that was typed. Anything to the right side of the right side bearing over here will be drawn in the space of the subsequent glyph. So you can overlap them that way by simply extending one way or the other. And you can move the right side bearing. Um, Everything is measured from the zero point on the, the zero bearing here. So you can move it, but you really don't want to. Then vertically, you have uh, the baseline glyph, which is our baseline, which is uh, here. And you have a descender, which is how far down your glyph can extend down. It's not marking it on the side here for some reason. I'm not sure why it's not displaying it. Um, there's a, a limit to how far down it can go. And there is uh, the X line, which is across here. And then there is the ascender, which is up here. And if you draw a glyph that goes above the ascender, it will get chopped off. If you draw a glyph that goes below the descender, it will get chopped off. Or it will interfere with the characters on the line above or below. And you'll. It can look really ugly. So you want to stay inside those parameters. And you can adjust those parameters, but the defaults are the best things to stick with. Um, a lot of people writing font software libraries don't go into diligently checking all this stuff. So you can end up with uh, really weird things happening if you try and make a font that's too tall or goes down too far. It's better to fix it all inside the same area and, and try and stick with the standards because that's what the writing software you're going to use this in is probably going to do. It's going to assume that's what you've done. So it won't actually check the um, 
the ascender line at the top or the descender line at the bottom, it will, in a lot of cases anyway, uh, just assume that they're the standards. And I've experimented with doing that. And you can do it, but it often doesn't work the same in multiple different programs. Um, wow. Sorry, I keep saying wow and looking at various things. I normally stream on Twitch, but I, I stream games on Twitch. Um, specifically an old game called Dark Age of Camelot. I do the font stuff on YouTube, and I'm still getting used to how YouTube works. And honestly, some parts work really well, but there's some really weird stuff coming from, from Twitch. Like, I have a chat window here. On Twitch, I can chat in that chat window if I want. On YouTube, I can't. I have to actually enter stuff on my phone. Uh, on Twitch, I can tell how many people there are. On YouTube, I can't. At least I don't think I can. Let's see what that does. Participant. Ah, looks like it's just me, according to uh, Twitch, or according to YouTube. And that's another thing, is that YouTube doesn't seem to report stuff all that well. Um, oh, no, it does look like it's just me. Um, okay, this will appear as a, uh, uh, a VOD on my YouTube channel anyway. So I'm just going to carry on with what I was doing. And I will take out these characters. Delete. And move the left bearing, or the right bearing to the left bearing so that no glyph actually gets typed. And here we have to decompose and then select all and delete and move that over. That way you can, what character was that? D, you can type a D, nothing will happen. The, there won't be a space, just nothing will happen, except that my script is gonna say, oh, you didn't really wanna type a D, you want to type a T. So this is just doing due diligence to make sure something doesn't accidentally show up under any circumstance. Decompose. Nope. Flatten layers. Nope. Weird. What has it done? That one loads fine. I come back here. Oh. Somehow didn't have it selected or something. Flat layer. No. Remove layer. No, I don't want to risk buggering everything up. Okay, well, that does it. That will do. I don't know what happened there that it wouldn't let me select the handles on it or anything, but there we go. Now it's done something weird. Control Z. Back to here. Here was where I wanted to do that. Delete. That didn't select that. Delete. Move that back. Glyph, decompose, control A, delete, back, glyph, decompose, no, this way then, delete, 
hopefully that's not getting rid of the thing left elsewhere. And all of those should now, oh, got the margin at zero. You screw yourself up no end if you forget to adjust your margin. Margin to zero. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's okay. And that's okay. Okay, I'm going to close this font in case it made a change somewhere there. Um, there. Didn't. And then we're going to go through this one and highlight each of these and change their flag to none. Flag none. That takes away the colored background. So I think save. I think I have it all working here. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, Jansen M., half a go for now. Much appreciate the over of all, overview of all this. We'll come back to this for future reference. Yeah, no problem. Um, when I'm done with this, it'll be a VOD on the channel there. I've got some other uh, videos that I've made about um, uh, the fonts that I've worked on. I've got other fonts I haven't made videos about. And... I'm hoping that I can take this or at least footage from this and boil it down into a short video when I'm done. That's part of the plan here is live stream it, talk to people, get, you know, conversation happening, everything else like that. Work my way through all this stuff and then see if I can extract enough from it to make a, you know, five minute video or something like that. And then I'll post that. And uh, I will be doing more stuff on creating uh, constructed writing systems and, uh, Eventually, perhaps Conlangs, although the writing systems are my forte more than anything else. But thank you for dropping by. Have a good day. Very nice to meet you. Now, I think that's all up to snuff. Oh, yeah. I was going to show off one thing. There is a thing they do with Kufic Arabic where they make geometric shapes that have a word. And this is my attempt at one of them that I built because I wanted to have something for the title page of the design document I'm building for my language. So that is Ashwadi in geometric shapes in my writing system done in the same style that uh, they do in Arabic. And I included it in the font at the uh, percent symbol. Just the hell of it. So I think that everything here... Oh, there is one more thing here. The X character. I'm not using an X. And it produces an arrow. And I included that in there so that I could type in... Things like that when I'm documenting this, just to easily let me document a, a, this shifts to that, which is kind of cheating, but, you know. Um, what else do we need to do here? I think this is actually pretty feature complete. Um, I did find... I did find an error in the way this font worked. And since this is the original version of the font with a pile of stuff pulled out, that error still exists in the original version, and I need to go fix that. But, excuse me. Otherwise, I think this is all working. Uh...
Oh, I suppose I could show off some other things too. This does have numbers. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. And it does have some things like uh, brackets or I think I've got another set of brackets in there too. And it does have some punctuation. Um, it has some code in there so that when you hit the double quotes, it will put the left one up if there's no text after it. And at the end of text, it'll put the right one up. So uh, the, the whole appearance balances a little bit. It has... Uh, Um, greater than and sorry, less than and greater than. It has a question mark. It has uh, curly brackets, which look like this. And a period. And anything else I've left out there? Oh, yeah, there's the exclamation mark, which is the question mark with a dot over top of it. And I think that is pretty much it. Um, I haven't gone and defined all the other punctuation that could be included in there. There's no plus or minus sign. Punctuation is a real pain. Um, so I've kind of avoided that, and also I don't really need it. Now, I did say earlier on that the original font marked for voicing and marked for uh, fricatives or affricates, and it didn't need it. And this version is actually what you would see written in manuscripts and stuff like that. But I do have a justification for using the diacritics, and that is, in my world, this language is used to record religious texts. And not everybody who is learning the religious texts is going to speak the Ashwadi language very well. So the scholars in the temples include the diacritics in there to make sure people are pronouncing things correctly. That, that's my reasoning that I've come up with. It was actually part of the the design idea originally before I realized that I, I basically had done it wrong. But now it's my rationalization, not just my, my reasoning. So there is one other thing that I'm looking at, but it's going to be a separate project in the future, not, not something I do right now. And that is that I can better save this save glyph add layer um current glyph only for now because i'm just testing okay so now there's a layer over top of here and my font software has a brush which i am going to set oh it's at 150 I'm going to consider drawing, mind you, keep this in mind, 435 glyphs in a handwritten style using this brush. And I'm just going to check and see what it looks like on the preview. If I type in If I type in an A, I get the handwritten version like that. So I could apply this to a version of this and use the original mechanically perfect shapes as templates for doing a handwritten version over top. And that would, that would work. I can do that. That's going to be a separate project, though. 
Um, and I'm going to have a edit undo, edit undo add layer there. Um, I'm going to have a, a, a whole separate check on doing that because that would be very slick to produce a sort of handwritten version rather than a, a smooth sort of modern perfect version, which is what I have now. The other font software I mentioned does not, to the best of my knowledge, have this brush feature. That's a, a perk from uh, FontLab Studio. Anyway, um, I think that I am probably done with this. I'm just going to check something here and see what it says. Doesn't say anything. YouTube being primitive. Okay. Um, I am going to make this a short stream because in the past I have done like five or six hour live streams. And the end result is nobody watches them. I mean, I get one or two people during the course of the, the stream, which I've had here and I really appreciate. But nobody ever goes back later and watches more than like, say, 20 minutes of them. So I'm hoping by making a shorter stream, they're not going to click on it and go, oh, my God, it's five hours. No way. And click off on something else. And I've been streaming now for a little over an hour. And I think that's all I need to do. I've covered the stuff I wanted to cover. I've explained some things to people. And I have um, finished the changes that I wanted to do to this, it wasn't very many done on screen. They were done off screen, but I've, I've done all that stuff. Um, and, and basically achieved what I wanted to do. I'm just looking for a screen here. I do not have it. I'll have to add that next time. Okay. Um, have a good day, folks. Um, please check out my channel on uh, YouTube. Please hit sub. I need to get to uh, a thousand followers and uh, 4,000 hours watched in the past 12 months to get monetized on YouTube. And I am a third of the way there almost on uh, followers, subscribers. And I am about an eighth of the way on hours watched, excuse me. So I'm, I'm progressing. I haven't been doing live streaming all that long. I haven't really been working on YouTube all that long. So I'm getting somewhere with that. I have been on YouTube for ages, but uh, only really started producing videos with any intensity and focus uh, a couple of months ago. So I'm extremely happy with progress, but I want all the people I can get. Have a good day. We'll call that done. And I hope to hear from you next time as well. Bye.